I didn't choose to start my talk with a cupcake because I like eating cupcakes, but I do. They're delicious. I put a cupcake up here because cupcakes are cute and sexy. But biting into a cupcake is messy. So is leadership. We see leadership in cupcakes in the same way. Like cupcakes, leadership is sexy. We give teens leadership awards. We send them on leadership retreats, and we provide them with leadership classes. We invest time, energy, and resources into preaching leadership. But biting into leadership is just as messy. Flour, sugar, eggs, butter, milk, they're all common ingredients that, when assembled correctly, form a perfect cake base and fluffy frosting. Good leaders take intellect, a team, objectives, resources, and assemble organizations. But good leaders are constantly cleaning up the messes they make. Leaders are always struggling to trust their intellect, to motivate their teams, to reach objectives, and to find enough resources. By my senior year in high school, I was considered a leader. I won leadership awards and spoke at leadership conferences, but I want to make something very clear. I did not learn to be a leader at school. No one taught me how to be a leader. I learned to lead people by leading them. My passion was strong enough that I had to do something. But in 2006, I was a typical teenager. I was absolutely terrified of public speaking. I had never written a grant proposal, and I had never managed a team of staff and interns. But now I've done those things, and today I want to share with you what I've learned along the way. Four years ago, my friend returned from a leadership retreat. <coughs> Katie was horrified. She had traveled around the world with her family, but had never heard of the child sex trade, the issue that a boy at her conference spoke about. Katie returned to Newton and told a few of her friends what she learned. I was 14 at the time, so when I found out that the average age of entry into prostitution in the United States was just 13, I was shocked. I remember asking myself, how could I continue living such a normal life while knowing that so many teens, just like me, were being sold? I couldn't. I had to do something. Obviously, being 14, none of us had much experience in nonprofit management. But all of us wanted to help Katie donate $5,000 to a rehabilitation center in the Philippines. Students were always holding bake sales and concerts and auctions, but we wanted to do something different and involve our community. So we gathered up everything, from sofas to wedding dresses to snow skis, and held a giant yard sale. Everyone told us we were crazy to think a yard sale could raise that much money. But we didn't listen and our yard sale raised $6,500. That yard sale was a turning point in what we believed we were capable of. All of a sudden, our idealistic approach seemed realistic. We started to believe in ourselves, but people around us still questioned our taking on such a serious cause. Yes, we found out what sex was just recently. <laughs> but that doesn't mean we should avoid speaking out against sexual exploitation. First, we were not a community. A group of teens met in a living room for three hours every Sunday night. But we were awkward. We were so different. I was a girly girl who loved clothes, shoes, and everything sparkly, while my Minga peers couldn't care less about fashion, but loved the Beatles. Some of us were idealistic and optimistic, while others were quick to focus on pragmatism. For months, our meetings involved yelling and often tears. But our growing pains were crucial to our development. Now we are Minga, and we are powerful. The word Minga means the coming together of a community to work for the betterment of all, in Quechua, a language of Ecuador. When we first started out, we knew little about the child sex trade, nothing about nonprofit organizations, and nothing of the direction we were headed. But our naivete gave way to Minga's most powerful asset, our brand. Every meeting we had, every event we held, even every letter we wrote felt authentic, fun, and youthful. While we had a clear brand, our purpose was still evolving. At first, we focused on providing rehabilitation services to child survivors in the Philippines and in Guatemala. Some of us even traveled to each project site to interact with our cause and to witness our achievements firsthand. But as we grew older and more knowledgeable about our cause, 
we realized that many other groups were far better equipped to rescue and rehabilitate child victims in foreign countries. In the time it took us to build a home for nine kids in the Philippines, hundreds of thousands of kids worldwide had been trapped in the trade, thousands from the United States. Every year, an estimated 325,000 kids in our nation are sold. While the U.S. makes up just 5% of the world's total population, over 25% of all John's customers in the trade are from here. Here, kids were being sold just as they were everywhere else worldwide, but no one knew. No one talked about a domestic child sex trade. Few people even believe us when we say that in our airports, our shopping malls, our train stations, children are being sold. In the spring of 2009, we had a 20-hour meeting. We sat in Katie's living room for all of Saturday and all of Sunday just talking. We realized that preventing our generation from being involved in the trade as victims or abusers was up to us. We changed our purpose to educating young people in the United States about the trade and empowering them to take action against it. Our message was powerful because it was coming from us, teenagers. Teens at our speeches could relate to us. We looked like ordinary teens because we are. We text, we use Facebook, and we video chat with our friends just like they do. We get millennials because we are millennials. We realize that shows like Gossip Girl and music videos like PIMP by 50 Cent make prostitution look luxurious. Advertisements for American Apparel and Abercrombie and & Fitch sexualize children. Our culture has accepted this view of young people as sex objects. Our teens develop a false conception of what prostitution is and what the trade life is really like. We wanted to show teens everywhere the real child sex trade, so we launched our Let's Get Real campaign. We want two million teens to speak out, since every year more than two million children are sold. In 2009, we were also juniors in high school and most of us were learning how to drive. We started joking at our weekly meetings that taking a Minga road trip would be fun. Week after week, someone would mention the idea and everyone would laugh. Then finally, at one meeting, we actually discussed the possibility of driving through the United States and Canada to launch our Let's Get Real campaign. We figured a group of teens driving thousands of miles in an awesome car to drive away the child sex trade would attract some attention. And we became obsessed with the idea. Now, as you might guess, our parents were not excited but instead horrified when all of us returned home adamant that together we would spend four weeks driving thousands of miles educating hundreds of teens along the way. Every parent said no. None of us had been driving for more than a few months, and only Ben would have his license by the summer. All of us were 16. We had no itinerary, and we had no speaking offers. Our parents held a meeting and literally generated dozens of reasons why the Minga road trip would not be happening. <laughs> they should have known us by then, but I guess we surprised them again. Let this be a word of caution to all. Never underestimate the power of traveling without parents as an incentive to a group of teenagers. <laughs> Within a few weeks, we had a full itinerary of speeches in 10 cities in the US and Canada. We got a minivan donated and researched car painting techniques. Each of us had reached out to family, friends, and cities we hoped to visit and had secured permission to stay in living rooms and basements for as long as we needed. We set up interviews with our local newspapers, radio channels, and TV stations. Within a month of our initial road trip meeting, we had made it clear to our parents that we were going. We named our van Barnabas. We wanted Barnabas to be jaw-droppingly awesome. So we spent four days washing, two days priming, and five days painting Barnabas. We bought nearly every bright colored bottle of spray paint at Home Depot. And at checkout, the cashier actually asked me where I planned to commit so much graffiti. <laughs> I explained that we had decided to paint our car with bright splotches of color and to write www.mingagroup.org on its sides and let's get real on the hood. We wanted teens everywhere to be excited about our road trip and to feel like they too could become a part of our movement. We spent four weeks driving more than 4,000 miles to educate and empower some 400 young people. From Boston, to Montreal, 
to Toronto, to Detroit, to Chicago, to Columbus, to DC, to New York City. Communities everywhere were speaking out. Now, a year later, we've educated more than 10,000 young people. We've empowered over 30 groups of teens nationwide to start their own Minga clubs in their communities. We've created an established website with clear, accessible information about the child sex trade. We're currently working to introduce a curriculum so that teachers of any subject can dedicate one class to educating their students about the risks of becoming involved in the trade. I direct our PSA campaign, an initiative to reach two million teens via screens. We're producing an educational public service announcement with a range of A-list celebrities who will appeal to different demographics of youth. Since all teens, regardless of their race, socioeconomic status, or geographic location, are at risk. I want to bring you back to my first speech. I was 15, and I was speaking at the Kids Risk Symposium to a room full of Harvard University professors and for-profit executives from huge corporations. I was terrified. I nearly threw up while walking on stage, but I went out there and I read word for word off my PowerPoint slides. At the end of my speech, another speaker was inspired that I was doing something. He deferred his $1,000 speaker's fee to Minga. Now, even if I'd taken a public speaking course at school and earned all A's on my speeches, I never would have experienced the confidence boost I gained that day. Looking back, that was an awful speech. But that speech was crucial to my development, not only as a speaker, but as a leader. In about 30 minutes, I had learned how to communicate my passion. I discovered my ability to impel action. So many teens share this type of story. Those of us revered as leaders among the social entrepreneurship community have all learned the skills we use every day by taking risks. Young social entrepreneurs aim to do more with less. People around us are always telling us we're too young to create change. Yet we take on some of our world's most severe social pandemics. And we use our age to our advantage. We score corporate support and donor support alike because our passion at such a young age is inspiring. I probably overwhelmed most of you and scared any parents out there that your kids are going to take a cross-country road trip whether you like it or not. And they might. But let me assure you that while Mingus teens started out as typical high school students, by 2009, we were all certifiably, atypically, unstoppable. Today, Mingus teens are spread out around the world. But our commitment to Minga continues to unite us. I want you to reflect on my story. Then ask yourself, if we encourage teens to take risks and give them real responsibility, What's the worst that could happen? They could fail. But I've failed before, and look, I'm still here. The best way to teach our generation to lead is to let us lead now. Don't tell us to wait five years. Tell us to try now. Don't tell us not to take on serious causes. Applaud our deep understanding of human need. If you want to empower us, Stop seeing us as either cute kids or juvenile delinquents. And realize that so many of us teens are so much more. Thank you.